good evening, and welcome to Dr. Peace Theater. My name is Dr. Dennis Business, and tonight, tonight, we will complete our dive into the second of the short stories contained within the pages of the Bachman books. The End of the Long Walk. When we last left Ray Garrity and our friends on the road, only nine remain. Abraham, Stebbins, McVries, Ray Garrity, Art Baker, Radigan, Bill Hugh, George Fielder, Bruce Pastor, and an unknown boy. They are 14 miles from the Massachusetts border. And that is where we end our story, with chapter 17 and 18. The concentrates were being passed out for the fifth and last time. It only took one of the soldiers to pass them out now. There were only nine walkers left. Some of them looked at the belts dully, as if they had never seen such things, and let them slide out of their hands like slippery snakes. It took Garrity what seemed like hours to make his hands go through the complicated ritual of snapping the belt closed around his waist, and the thought of eating made his cramped and shriveled stomach feel ugly and nauseated. Stebbins was now walking beside him. My guardian angel, Garrity thought. As Garrity watched, Stebbins smiled widely and crammed two crackers smeared with peanut butter into his mouth. He ate noisily. Garrity felt sick. What's the matter? Stebbins asked around his sticky mouthful. Can't take it? What business is it of yours? Stebbins swallowed with what looked to Garrity like real effort. None. If you faint from malnutrition, all the better for me. We're going to make it into Massachusetts, I think, McVree said sickly. Stebbins nodded. The first walk to do it in 17 years. They'll go crazy. How do you know so much about the long walk? Garrity asked abruptly. Stebbins shrugged. It's all on record. They don't have anything to be ashamed of. Now do they? What'll you do if you win, Stebbins? McFreeze asked. Stebbins laughed. In the rain, his thin, fuzzed face, lined with fatigue, looked lion-like. What do you think? Get a big yellow Cadillac with a purple top and a color TV with stereo speakers for every room of the house? I'd expect... McVries said that you'd donate two or three hundred grand to the Society for Intensifying Cruelty to Animals. Abraham looked like a sheep, Garrity said abruptly, like a sheep caught on a barbed wire. That's what I thought. They passed under a huge banner that proclaimed they were now only fifteen miles from the Massachusetts border. There was really not much of a New Hampshire along US 1, only a narrow neck of land separating Maine and Massachusetts. Garrity, Stebbins said amiably, why don't you go have sex with your mother? Sorry, you're not pushing the right button anymore. He deliberately selected a bar of chocolate from his belt and crammed it whole into his mouth. His stomach nodded furiously, but he swallowed the chocolate, and after a short, tense struggle with his own insides, he knew he was going to keep it down. I figure I can walk a full day if I have to, he said casually, and another two if I need to. Resign yourself to it, Stebbins. Give up the old sigh war. It doesn't work. Have some more crackers and peanut butter. Stebbins' mouth pursed tightly. Just for a moment, but Garrity saw it. He had gotten under Stebbins' skin. He felt an incredible surge of elation. The mother load at last. Come on, Stebbins, 
he said. Tell us why you're here, seeing as we won't be together much longer. Tell us. Just between the three of us, now that we know you're not Superman. Stebbins opened his mouth and with shocking abruptness, he threw up the crackers and peanut butter he had eaten, almost whole and seemingly untouched by digestive juices. He staggered, and for only the second time since the walk began, he was warned. Garrity felt hard blood drumming in his head. Come on, Stebbins. You've thrown up. Now own up. Tell us. Stebbins' face had gone the color of old cheesecloth, but he had his composure back. Why am I here? You want to know? McVries was looking at him curiously. No one was near. The closest was Baker, who was wandering along the edge of the crowd, looking intently into its mass face. Why am I here or why do I walk? Which do you want to know? I want to know everything, Garrity said. It was only the truth. I'm the rabbit, Stebbins said. The rain fell steadily, dripping off their noses, hanging in droplets on their earlobes like earrings. Up ahead, a barefoot boy, his feet purple patchworks of burst veins, went to his knees, crawled along with his head bobbing madly up and down, tried to get up, fell, and finally made it. He plunged onward. It was Pastor, Garrity noted with some amazement. Still with us. I'm the rabbit, Stebbins repeated. You've seen them, Garrity, the little gray mechanical rabbits that the greyhounds chase at the dog races. No matter how fast the dogs run, they can never quite catch the rabbit. Because the rabbit isn't flesh and blood, and they are. The rabbit, he's just a cutout on a stick attached to a bunch of cogs and wheels. In the old days, in England, they used to use a real rabbit. But sometimes the dogs caught it. More reliable this new way. He fooled me. Stebbins' pale blue eyes stared into the falling rain. Maybe you could even say he conjured me. He changed me into a rabbit. Remember the one in Alice in Wonderland? But maybe you're right, Garrity. It's time to stop being rabbits and grunting pigs and sheep and to be people. Even if we can only rise to the level of whore masters and perverts in the balconies of the theaters on 42nd Street. Stebbins' eyes grew wild and gleeful, and now he looked at Garrity and McVries, and they flinched away from that stare. Stebbins was crazy. In that instant, there could be no doubt of it. Stebbins was totally mad. His low-pitched voice rose to a pulpit shout. How come I know so much about the long walk? I know all about the long walk. I ought to. The Major is my father, Gary. He's my father. The crowd's voice rose in a mindless cheer that was monotonous and mindless in its intensity. They might have been cheering what Stebbins had said, if they could have heard it. The guns blasted. That was what the crowd was cheering. The guns blasted and Pastor rolled over dead. Garrity felt a crawling in his guts and scrotum. Oh my God, McVries said. Is it true? He ran his tongue over his cracked lips. It's true, Stebbins said almost genially. I'm his bastard, you see. I didn't think he knew. I didn't think he knew I was his son. That was where I made my mistake. He's a randy old son of a bitch, is the Major. I understand he's got dozens of little bastards. What I wanted was to spring it on him. Spring it on the world. Surprise, surprise! And when I won, the prize I was going to ask for was to be taken into my father's house. But he knew everything? McVries whispered. He made me his rabbit. A little gray rabbit to make the rest of the dogs run faster and farther. And I guess it worked. We're going to make it into Massachusetts. And now? Garrity asked. Stebbin shrugged. The rabbit turns out to be flesh and blood after all. I walk. I talk. 
and I suppose if this all doesn't end soon, I'll be crawling on my belly like a reptile. They passed under a heavy brace of power lines. A number of men in climbing boots clung to the support posts above the crowd, like grotesque praying mantises. What time is it? Stebbins asked. His face seemed to have melted in the rain. It had become Olson's face. Abraham's face. Barkovich's face. Then, terribly, Garrity's own face, hopeless and drained, sunken and crinelled in on itself. The face of a rotten scarecrow in a long-since harvested field. It's twenty until ten, McVrie said. He grinned, a ghostly imitation of his old cynical grin. Happy day five to you, suckers. Stebbins nodded. Will it rain all day, Garrity? Yeah, I think so. It looks that way. Stebbins nodded slowly. I think that, too. Well, come on in out of the rain, McVrie said suddenly. All right, thanks. They walked on, somehow in step, although all three of them were bent forever in different shapes by the pains that pulled them. When they crossed into Massachusetts, they were seven. Garrity, Baker, McVries, a struggling hollow-eyed skeleton named George Fielder, Bill Hugh, pronounced that huff, he had told Garrity much earlier on, a tallish, muscular fellow named Radigan, who did not seem to be in really serious shape yet, and Stebbins. The pomp and thunder of the border crossing slowly passed behind them. The rain continued constant and monotonous. The wind howled and ripped with all the young, unknowing cruelty of spring. It lifted caps from the crowd and whirled them, saucer-like in brief violent arcs, across the whitewash-colored sky. A very short while ago, just after Stebbins had made his confession, Garrity had experienced an odd, light lifting of his entire being. His feet seemed to remember what they had once been. There was kind of a frozen cessation to the blinding pains in his back and neck. It was like climbing up a final sheer rock face and coming out on the peak, out of the shifting mist of clouds and into the cold sunshine and the bracing, undernourished air, with no place to go but down, and that at flying speed. The half-track was a little ahead of them. Garrity looked at the blonde soldier, crouched under the big canvas umbrella on the back deck. He tried to project all the ache, all the rain-soaked misery out of himself and into the Major's man. The blonde stared back at him, indifferently. Garrity glanced over at Baker and saw that his nose was bleeding badly. Blood painted his cheeks and dripped from the line of his jaw. He's going to die, isn't he? Stebbins said. Sure, McVries answered. They've all been dying. Didn't you know? A hard gust of wind sheeted rain across them, and McVries staggered. He drew a warning. The crowd cheered on, unaffected and seemingly impervious. At least there had been fewer firecrackers today. The rain had put a stop to that happy bullshit. The road took them around a big banked curve, and Garrity felt his heart lurch. Faintly, he heard Radigan mutter, Good Jesus! The road was sunk between two sloping hills. The road was like a cleft between two rising breasts. The hills were black with people. The people seemed to rise above them and around them like the living walls of a huge dark slough. George Fielder came abruptly to life. His skull head turned slowly this way and that on his pipe stem neck. They're going to eat us up, he muttered. They're going to fall in on us and eat us up. I think not, Stebbins said shortly. There has never been a, they're going to eat us up. They're going to eat us up, eat us up, 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 eat us up, eat us up. George Fielder whirled around in a huge rambling circle, his arms flapping madly 
his eyes blazed with mousetrap terror. To Garrity, he looked like one of those video games gone crazy. Eat us up, 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 eat us up. He was screeching at the top of his voice, but Garrity could barely hear him. The waves of sound from the hills beat down on them like hammers. Garrity could not even hear the gunshots when Fielder bought out. Only the savage scream from the throat of crowd. Fielder's body did a gangling, but strangely graceful rumba in the center of the road. Feet kicking, body twitching, shoulders jerking. Then, apparently too tired to dance anymore, he sat down, legs spread wide, and he died that way. Sitting up, his chin tucked down on his chest like a tired little boy, caught by the Sandman at playtime. Garrity, Baker said. Garrity, I'm bleeding. The hills were behind them now, and Garrity could hear him badly. Yeah, he said. It was a struggle to keep his voice level. Something inside Art Baker had hemorrhaged. His nose was gushing blood. His cheeks and neck were lathered with gore. His shirt collar was soaked with it. It's not bad, is it? Baker asked him. He was crying with fear. He knew it was bad. No, it's not too bad. Garrity said. The rain feels so warm. Baker said, I know it's only rain, though. It's only rain, right? Garrity? Right. Garrity said sickly. I wish I had some ice to put on it, Baker said, and walked away. Garrity watched him go. Bill Huff, he pronounced that Huff, bought a ticket at quarter to eleven and rat again at 11.30, just after the Flying Deuce's precision flying team rocketed overhead in six electric blue F-11s. Garrity had expected Baker to go before either of them, but Baker continued on, although now the whole top of his shirt was soaked through. Garrity's head seemed to be playing jazz. Dave Brubeck, Thelonious Monk, Cannonball Adderley, the band noisemakers that everybody kept under the table and played when the party got noisy and drunk. It seemed that he had once been loved, once he himself had loved. But now it was just jazz and the rising drumbeat in his head, and his mother had only been a stuffed straw in a fur coat. Jan, nothing but a department store dummy. It was over. Even if he won, he managed to outlast McVries and Stebbins and Baker. It was over. He was never going home again. He began to cry a little bit. His vision blurred and his feet tangled up and he fell down. The pavement was hard and shockingly cold and unbelievably restful. He was worn twice before he managed to pick himself up using a series of drunken, crab-like motions. He got his feet to work again. He broke wind, a long, sterile rattle that seemed to bear no relationship at all to an honest fart. Baker was zigging and zagging drunkenly across the road and back. McVries and Stebbins had their heads together. Garrity was suddenly very sure they were plotting to kill him, the way someone named Barkovich had once killed a faceless number named Rank. He made himself walk fast, and caught up with them. They made room for him wordlessly. You've stopped talking about me, haven't you? But you were. Do you think I don't know? Do you think I am nuts? But there was a comfort. He wanted to be with them. He wanted to stay with them until he died. They passed a sign now, which seemed to summarize to Garrity's dumbly wondering eyes all the screaming insanity there might be in the universe all the idiot whistling laughter of the spheres, and this sign read, 49 miles to Boston. Walkers, you can make it. He would have shrieked with laughter if he had been able. Boston. The sound was very mythic, rich with unbelievability. Baker was beside him again. Garrity? What? 
Are we in? Huh? Are we in? Garrity, please. Baker's eyes pleaded. He was an abattoir. A raw blood machine. Yeah. We're, we're in. We're, we're in, Art. He had no idea what Baker was talking about. I'm going to die now, Garrity. All right. If you win, will you do something for me? I'm scared to ask anyone else. And Baker made a sweeping gesture at the deserted road as if the walk was still rich with its dozens. For a chilling moment, Garrity wondered if maybe they were all there still. Walking ghosts that Baker could now see in his moment of extremis. Anything. Baker put a hand on Garrity's shoulder, and Garrity began weeping uncontrollably. It seemed that his heart would burst out of his chest and weep its own tears. Baker said, Lead-lined. Walk a little bit longer, Garrity said through his tears. Walk a little longer, Art. No, I can't. All right. Maybe I'll see you, man, Baker said, and wiped slick blood from his face absently. Garrity lowered his head and wept. Don't watch him do it, Baker said. Promise me that, too. Garrity nodded, beyond speech. Thanks. You've been my friend, Garrity. Baker tried to smile. He stuck his hand blindly out, and Garrity shook it with both of his. Another time, another place, Baker said. Garrity put his hands up over his face and had to bend over to keep walking. The sobs ripped out of him and made him ache with a pain that was far beyond anything the walk had been able to inflict. He had hoped he wouldn't hear the shots. But he did. They were forty miles from Boston. Tell us a story, Garrity, Stebbins said abruptly. Tell us a story that will take our minds off our troubles. He had aged unbelievably. Stebbins was an old man. Yeah, McVries said. He also looked ancient and wizened. A story, Garrity. Garrity looked from one to the other dully, but he could see no duplicity in their faces. Only the bone wariness. He was falling off his own peak now. All the ugly, dragging pains were rushing back in. He closed his eyes for a long moment. When he opened them, the world had doubled and came only reluctantly back into focus. All right, he said. McVries clapped his hands solemnly three times. He was walking with three warnings. Garrity had one, Stebbins none. Once upon a time... Oh, who wants to hear a fucking fairy story? Stebbins asked. McVries giggled a little. You'll hear what I want to tell you, Garrity said shrewishly. You want to hear it or not? Stebbins stumbled against Garrity. Both he and Stebbins were warned. I suppose a fairy story is better than no story at all. It's not a fairy story anyway. Just because it's in a world that never was doesn't mean it's a fairy story. It doesn't mean... Are you going to tell it or not? McVries asked pettishly. Once upon a time, Garrity began, there was a white knight that went out into the world on a sacred quest. He left his castle and walked through the enchanted forest. Knights ride, Stebbins objected, rode through the enchanted forest then road and he had many strange adventures he fought off thousands of trolls and goblins and a whole shitload of wolves all right 
and he finally got to the king's castle and asked permission to take Gwendolyn, the famous Lady Fair, out walking. McBreeze cackled. The king wasn't digging it, thinking no one was good enough for his daughter Gwen, the world-famous Lady Fair, but the Lady Fair loved the White Knight so much that she threatened to run away into the wild woods if... if... A wave of dizziness rode over him darkly, making him feel as if he were floating. The roar of the crowd came to him like the boom of the sea down a long, cone-shaped tunnel. Then it passed, but slowly. He looked around. McVries's head had dropped, and he was walking at the crowd, fast asleep. Hey! Garrity shouted. Hey, Pete! Pete! Let him alone, Stebbin said. You made the promise like the rest of us. Fuck you, Garrity said distinctly and darted to McVree's side. He touched McVree's shoulders, setting him straight again. McVree's looked up at him sleepily and smiled. No, Ray, it's time to sit down. Terror pounded Garrity's chest. No, no way! McVries looked at him for a moment, and then smiled again, and shook his head. He sat down, cross-legged on the pavement, and looked like a world-beaten monk. The scar on his cheek was a white slash in the rainy gloom. No! Garrity screamed. He tried to pick McVries up, but, thin as he was... McVries was much too heavy. McVries wouldn't even look at him. His eyes were shut, and suddenly two of the soldiers were wrenching McVries away from him. They were putting their gun to McVries' head. No! Garrity screamed again. Me! Shoot me! But instead they gave him his third warning. McVries opened his eyes and smiled again. The next instant, he was gone. Garrity walked unknowingly now. He stared blankly at Stebbins, who stared back at him curiously. Garrity was filled with a strange, roaring emptiness. Finish the story, Stebbins said. Finish the story, Garrity. No, Garrity said. I don't think so. Let it go, then, Stebbins said and smiled winningly. If there are such things as souls... His is still close. You could catch up. Garrity looked at Stebbins and said, I'm going to walk you into the ground. Oh, Pete, he thought. He didn't even have any tears left to cry. Are you? said Stebbins. We'll see. By eight that evening, they were walking through Danvers, and Garrity finally knew. It was almost done, because Stebbins could not be beaten. I spent too much time thinking about it. McVries, Baker, Abraham. They didn't think about it. They just did it. As if it was natural. And it is natural. In a way, it's the most natural thing in the world. He shambled along, bulge-eyed, jaw hanging a gap, rain swishing in. For a misty, shutter-like moment, he thought he saw someone he knew, knew as well as himself, weeping and beckoning in the dark ahead, but it was no use. He couldn't go on. He would just tell Stebbins. He was up ahead a little, limping quite a bit now, and looking emaciated. Garrity was very tired, but he was no longer afraid. He felt calm. He felt okay. He made himself go faster until he could put a hand on Stebbins' shoulder. Stebbins, he said. Stebbins turned and looked at Garrity with huge, floating eyes that saw nothing for a moment. Then recognition came, and he reached out and clawed at Garrity's shirt, pulling it open. The crowd screamed its anger at this interference. 
but only Garrity was close enough to see the horror in Stebbins' eyes. The horror. The darkness. And only Garrity knew that Stebbins' grip was a last despairing reach for rescue. Oh, Garrity! He cried and fell down. Now the sound of the crowd was apocalyptic. It was the sound of mountains falling and breaking, the earth shattering. The sound crushed Garrity easily. Oh, Garrity. Three. Oh, Garrity! He cried and fell down. Now the sound of the crowd was apocalyptic. It was the sound of mountains falling and breaking, the earth shattering. The sound crushed Garrity easily beneath it. It would have killed him if he had heard it. But he heard nothing but his own voice. Stebbins? He said curiously. He bent and somehow managed to turn Stebbins over. Stebbins still stared at him, but the despair had already skimmed over. His head rolled bonelessly on his neck. He put a cupped hand in front of Stebbins' mouth. Stebbins? He said again. But Stebbins was dead. Garrity lost interest. He got to his feet and began to walk. Now the cheers filled up the earth and fireworks lit up the sky. Up ahead a jeep roared towards him. No vehicles on the road, you damn fool. That's a capital offense. They can shoot you for that. The major stood in the jeep. He held a stiff salute, ready to grant first wish. Every wish, any wish, death wish. The prize. Behind him, they finished by shooting the already dead Stebbins. And now there was only him, alone on the road, walking towards the Major's jeep. It had stopped diagonally across the white line, and the Major was getting out, coming to him, his face kind and unreadable behind the mirror sunglasses. Garrity stepped aside. He was not alone. The dark figure was back up, up ahead, not far, beckoning. He knew that figure. If he could just get a little closer, he could make out the features. Which one hadn't he walked down? Was it Barkovich? Collie Parker? Percy What's-His-Name? Who was it? Garrity! The crowd screamed it deliriously. Garrity! Garrity! Was it Scram? Gribble? Davidson? A hand on his shoulder. Garrity shook it off impatiently. The dark figure beckoned, beckoned in the rain, beckoned for him to come and walk, to come and play the game, and it was time to get started. There was still so far to walk. Eyes blind, supplicating hands held out before him as if for alms. Garrity walked towards the dark figure, and when the hand touched his shoulder again, he somehow found the strength to run. And with the completion of chapter 17 and 18, we come to the end of the long walk. The second short story contained within the pages of the Bachman books. Ray Garrity walked down 99 other competitors in the worst contest anybody ever imagined. And the thing about the Bachman books is that a lot of times the journey is much better than the destination. And I'm glad that I actually made it to the end because that was a long time coming. But we can talk about how things turned out next time because this has been Dr. Peace Theater. And my name is Dr. Dennis Business. And as always, my friends. <laughs>